okay so when we discussed about uh, the live attenuated vaccines and we have seen how that vaccine is being used for the purpose of prophylaxis now as compared to live in attenuated vaccines we have uh, another variety and that is inactivated or killed vaccines as the name itself indicates it is inactivated and killed both the things are there basically this suspension or a vaccine consists of organisms which are grown in culture definitely under certain controlled conditions and these organisms are then killed by using certain physical or chemical methods for example heat by heating them at certain temperature for few minutes would inactivate it or i would say kill the organisms or in presence of certain chemicals like formaldehyde these organisms will be killed so first of all organisms are grown the virulent organisms are grown then they are killed either by heat or by chemicals like formaldehyde this would ultimately result in the loss of virulence because the organisms are now killed but their antigenicity is as it is their antigenicity is maintained as it is in a live organism and therefore this proves to be a highly immunogenic one more important advantage of killed vaccines is that it is very safe to use as compared to live vaccines killed vaccines can be used in larger doses along with adjuvants and multiple doses can be given to confirm the to confer the immunity killed vaccines also has one disadvantage i would not call it very much a disadvantage but since the organisms are killed they would never multiply in the body as in case of live vaccines and therefore in most cases booster dose is necessary booster dose means second dose or a third dose in many cases is required okay the use of adjuvants would increase the immunogenicity of the antigens for example alum is used as adjuvant in dpt vaccines diphtheria polio and tetanus diphtheria pertussis and tetanus now these killed vaccines are normally given or they are administered subcutaneously or through intramuscular routes and the one absolute contradiction is that severe local or general reactions to the first doses have been found to occur in few cases now there are certain examples of killed or inactivated vaccines for example in case of bacteria bacterial vaccines we have typhoid cholera pertussis and plague vaccines while in case of killed virus used as a vaccines it includes injectable polio vaccines ipv injectable polio vaccine or it is known as a sarc vaccines named after its discover jonas sarc then you also have killed influenza vaccine rabies vaccine vaccine against hepatitis a and japanese b encephalitis vaccines 
Now, let us compare the characteristics of killed and live vaccines. We will discuss point by point various characteristics and this would make you very clear the advantages, disadvantages of live and killed vaccines. First, the number of doses. In case of killed vaccines, the number of doses required are multiple doses. While in case of live vaccines, usually single dose will suffice. The reason being very simple that since it is a live vaccine, these organisms can multiply in the body of the patient or body of the host. And therefore, a level, a particular level of organism is maintained constantly for few days. While in case of killed vaccines, because the organisms are killed, they cannot, they have lost the ability to multiplication. Therefore, after certain days, a second dose is required. So, multiple doses, in few cases, these multiple doses can be many at regular time interval. Second is the need for adjuvants. You know, adjuvants are certain chemicals or the materials which when injected along with the organisms would increase its immunogenicity. How? How does it increase the immunogenicity? These adjuvants along with the microorganisms when they are injected it forms a depot or they accumulate at the dose where the vaccine has been given and from that depot they are released slowly and slowly when we use adjuvants. So adjuvants are you can say a kind of a sustained release vaccines and these are necessary for killed vaccines. However, for live vaccines such adjuvants are usually not required. Next is the duration of immunity. In case of killed vaccines, the duration is naturally shorter. <clears throat> the reason is the very first reason which I gave you that since they are killed within a short time, they will be eliminated from the body by various mechanisms. While in case of live vaccines, the immunity is for a longer time period as the organism keeps on multiplying in the body. Then effectiveness of protection. In case of killed vaccines, the effectiveness is lower as compared to live vaccines. The reasons are the same. Then next is mimics the natural infection. Well, mimics the natural infection. Mimics means something which is similar. Live vaccines, they mimic as if it is a natural infection. Therefore, the immunity which is conferred is very high and it is very close to a natural infections. Well, in case of killed vaccines, since the organisms are killed, they are not going to damage the host. No, 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 no kind of symptoms will be observed. While in case of live vaccines, sometimes the person shows certain symptoms. Though they are attenuated, they will never be dangerous. But few symptoms are observed. For example, uh, fever, increase in temperature and in some cases certain reactions. Then comes the immunoglobulins, the type of immunoglobulins which are produced in both the cases. In case of killed vaccines, it is normally IgG type of immunoglobulin which are normally formed. While in case of uh, live vaccines, it is the IgA in the initial stages followed by 
IgG type of vaccines. Then mucosal immunity. It is totally absent in case of killed vaccines. The reason is simple because no IgA type of antibodies are formed. While in case of live vaccines, the mucosal immunity is induced because of the production of IgA. So, apart from this, the cell mediated immunity is poor in case of killed vaccines while in case of live vaccines it is induced. Now, in few cases it may happen that killed vaccines or sorry live vaccines it is possible since the organisms are live it may revert to its virulent form. I would say the possibility is highly negligible, very negligible, but still this possibility exists when we use live vaccines because they can revert back to virulent form. In case of killed vaccines, organisms are dead and therefore it is impossible. Then excretion of vaccine virus and transmission to non-immune contacts. Well, in case of Killed vaccines, it will never be possible, organisms are killed. So even if they are excreted out through stools, these organisms can never cause any disease to or it can never be transmitted to other non-immune individuals. While in case of live vaccines, it is possible because the organisms are live, they are excreted through certain roots portal of exits and it is possible that it may cause or it may be transmitted to other non-immune individuals. Next point is interferences by other microorganisms in host. Here killed vaccines they never interfere while in case of live vaccines it is possible that other microorganisms may interfere because there is always a mutual place of these organisms in a particular ecosystem. And when an outsider or the vaccine which has been orally or injected, which are live, then these organisms might have some interactions or influence with these vaccinated live vaccines. Then comes the stability at room temperature. Killed vaccines are naturally, they are highly stable because again the organisms are killed. While in case of live vaccines, the stability is an important criteria because they are live and these organisms, if not stored properly, then the vaccines can be damaged. The organisms can die at a very high temperature. And therefore, it is always possible that live vaccines needs a lower temperature for storage. And finally, the immunodeficiency and pregnancy. In case of killed vaccines, it is safe to inject these organisms, these vaccines in immunodeficient individuals as well as in pregnant women. But the same is not true for live vaccines. In case of live vaccines, is it, it is possible that immunodeficient individuals means whose immunity is uh, restricted or it is compromised either genetically or because of some other reasons. Then since their ability to induce immunity is compromised, these individuals can show the symptoms of the diseases. So it is not safe for immunodeficient as well as pregnant mother. So this was about the live attenuated and 
killed inactivated vaccines. Now coming to uh, another form of vaccine that is toxoid vaccine. Toxoid vaccines are basically the vaccines prepared by treating the toxins in such a way toxins produced by microorganisms or toxin produced by some other uh, reptiles for example snake and other things these toxins are treated in such a way that immunogenicity is retained while toxicity is reduced like in case of organisms virulence was reduced or eliminated while immunogenicity remained same but here it is the product of microorganism that is toxin product of a organism either from microorganism or from snake or other things other reptiles these toxins are toxic for the host and therefore these toxins they are treated in such a way that their toxicity is destroyed but immunogenicity remains as it is these are known as toxins there are certain microorganisms which produces endotoxins mostly belonging to gram negative group of organisms because when such organisms are ingested they would lyse and their lipopolysaccharide component of the cell wall is inducing toxicity these are known as endotoxins endotoxins are named so because they are produced inside the cell so these endotoxins produced by few bacteria they can be detoxicated to form toxoid so toxins when they are detoxicated will form toxoids and this is done by treating these toxins endotoxins and other things with acidic ph or using some chemicals like formalin or on a prolonged storage their toxicity will be destroyed so acidic ph use of chemicals like formalin and on a prolonged storage the certain toxins may lose its toxicity this would lead to the formation of toxoids so you can say what are toxoids toxoid is a form of toxins that loses its virulence property but retains immunogenicity here when we say it loses its virulence property this virulence property is basically in its toxicity so you can say toxoids are without its toxicity however it retains its immunogenicity okay now what happens when such toxoids are given or they are injected in form of toxoids so it induces the formation of neutralizing antibodies which are able to neutralize the toxin moiety produced during an infection that is on infection when we when certain organisms are ingested that would and when they lies in our intestinal tract they produce endotoxins these endotoxins will produce toxic effects in the body so this toxic effect is being neutralized by antitoxins which are produced by toxoids okay so it induces 
formation of neutralizing antibodies that are capable of neutralizing the toxin moiety produced during the infection. So it is toxin. Remember, what is the difference? It is being it is a toxin which is being neutralized, not the organism which produces the toxin. The, it is not the whole organism which is being destroyed. It is the particular product, particular moiety of these organisms, which is toxic in nature, it is being neutralized. So, it does not act upon the organism. These antitoxins, they do not act upon the organism, rather they would act upon the toxic moiety, that is the product produced by that organism. Examples are DT, that is diphtheria toxoid and tetanus toxoids. Diphtheria, it is a disease caused by the organism Corynebacterium diphtheri. It is the disease of respiratory tract and these organisms normally cause infections in the throat. This can be diagnosed by using a particular staining technique that we had already given a reference during the staining procedures. They possess, because coronibacterium diphtheri, they possess metachromatic granules. Now, these organisms, they produce toxins. And to neutralize these toxins, the person falls sick, not because of infection, but on infection, upon infection, these organisms produce toxins. And these toxins will lead to the kind of a discomfort in a host. So, it is the toxin which is basically responsible for the onset of symptoms. And therefore, the toxoids are formed by purifying that toxins and inactivating them. So, this is about diphtheria toxoid. Similarly, a very, very common toxoid is TT, tetanus toxoid. Tetanus toxoids are available very freely and uh, very cheap because these organisms, uh, these uh, TT, TT stands for tetanus. Tetanus is caused by Clostridium titani, whose pores are always there in soil. So, if a wound or a scratch is contaminated with soil or dust or any other materials which is left open in the environment, there is a possibility of these organisms, because these organisms, Clostridia, they produce spores which are very resistant and therefore it lives for a very long time in the environment. So, for any reasons, either during the some scratch on the body, during wound or for that matter, during uh, say some doing some job and uh, cutting your hand or anything like that, that would, doctor would always go for an injection of tetanus. He is basically injecting toxoids, TT, in short, tetanus toxoid. So when that injection is given of that toxoid, the host will respond by producing antitoxins. And therefore, it will be safe for a person if at all he has come into co uh, contamination by these dust and soil particles. These organisms, since they are anaerobic, may generate silently, may develop silently in the wound which normally may appear to be healed one. But beneath the tissues under anaerobic conditions, these organisms grow, develop and produce toxin. Remember, the tetanus toxin 
is a very 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 potent in nature few milligrams of these toxins i would say not milligrams micrograms of these toxins are enough to kill a human host so this is about another type of toxoid that is tt tetanus toxoid so after the third type we have already learned three types live attenuated second one killed or inactivated third one toxoids now coming to fourth one extracted or cellular fraction vaccines extracted or cellular fraction what does it mean extracted means a certain portion of the organism which one finds that this is having a potential antigenic effect in an organism that component is extracted from the whole organism or you can say a cellular component which is immunogenic and having certain virulent power is removed so it is not the whole organism it is only a fraction of the entire organism they are prepared from extracted cellular fractions these examples include meningococcal vaccines used against meningitis caused by nigeria meningitis pneumococcal vaccines caused by streptococcus pneumoniae and third one is vaccine against influenza that is haemophilus influenzae type vaccines hiv haemophilus influenzae type vaccines so these three examples are for cellular fraction vaccines now coming to uh, another type of vaccines which has been in use since or i would say recently since last 20 25 years maximum is the subunit vaccine these kinds of vaccines have come into use with the advancements of genetic engineering procedures here dna recombinant technology or you can call it as a r dna technology which is popularly known as genetic engineering techniques these techniques are being used for preparation of such sub viral components uh what is exactly done here is a fraction of a cell of the whole organism a gene for that fraction is isolated and it is injected or it is fused with some other dna and this would dna of some let us say innocent organism non pathogenic organism now since that gene producing a particular protein is now integrated with the non pathogenic organisms that organism would produce that protein which is having the same antigenicity because for any particular component produced by a microorganism there is a gene which is responsible so this gene is isolated from the complete genome of a pathogenic organism the isolated gene is fused with the dna or mrna of other um, non pathogenic organisms or i would say that gene is inserted into another organism host another host which is normally totally non pathogenic and that organism would now start expressing 
that protein so this is what we call it as a sub unit vaccines and the examples which are at present are sub unit vaccines of hepatitis b and another very common disease is human papilloma virus hpv human papilloma virus and this is basically responsible for certain kind of disease in females caused by papilloma virus next in line is combination vaccine as the name itself indicates combinations it is understood that more than one different type of vaccines are combined together or more than one type of immunizing agents are given together that is known as combination vaccines so if you want to define this you can say it if if more than one immunizing agents are included in a vaccine preparation it is known as combined vaccines the aim of combined vaccine is to simplify the administration and augment the immunogenicity of immunogen okay let us understand these things first is to simplify administration administration means injection giving a dose of that antigen now basically there are so many diseases against whom these vaccines have been prepared specifically for a child who is born he is to be given at certain regular interval various vaccines that is there is a scheduled immunizing same immunization program for a newly born child and this continues up to at least the age up to 10 or even further 10 to 15 years of age so there are so many vaccines to be given at a early stages of the life now scientists have found various compatible vaccines which can be mixed together and can be given in a single shot so that is what we call it as a ease or simplifying the administration of the vaccines second advantage is when such combination is being used at the time the one component from of one organism and the second component they may augment each other's immunogenicity which alone would not have been possible so two organisms three organisms mixed together either organisms or their product when they are given in a combination the immunogenicity level or that is immunogenicity is increased ultimately resulting into a prolonged and high level of antibody formation so you can say that combined vaccines they augment they augment the immunogenicity of an immunogen let us take the examples of such kinds of combined vaccines in case of bacteria dpt vaccine very very popular used since long since decades together it includes the preparations of diphtheria pertussis and tetanus three diseases together and similarly pentavalent vaccines of dpd that is three organisms then fourth one is hib hepatitis b and 
then H I P. So these are the pentavalent vaccines, five organisms together. And in case of viral vaccines, again very common vaccine which is existing since long is MMR vaccines. MMR stands for mumps, measles, and rubella. All three diseases are caused by viruses and suspension of these organisms or the product from each of these organisms is being mixed to form combined viral vaccines. Now, coming to another class that is what are the newer vaccine approaches. When I say newer vaccine approaches means these kinds of approaches have developed over last decade or so and many of them they have been successfully proved and few of them they are at a experimental stages. What are the advantages of such newer approaches? It is cost effective and is capable of giving a powerful that is stronger and a broad spectrum range of immune response, wider range of immune response. Here small pieces of DNA containing genes from different pathogenic organisms are injected into the host. So what we are injecting is the small segments, small fractions of DNA. And why small fractions? Because the gene which is coding for a particular protein is not very long. For example, in case of an ordinary organism like E. coli, there are more than 4000 genes. Out of which the one which is needed, similarly for any other pathogenic organism, the gene which is responsible for immunogenicity is picked up. And then these are injected into the host. As a result, the gene which has been injected, it gets integrated into the host cell genome and will start transcribing the proteins against which the host will express an immune response. So this is a kind of a newer approach. Thinking this is basically it is based on a thinking that the DNA responsible for a certain protein of the pathogenic organism that gene is isolated it is injected into the host thinking that in few cases because there are not only one gene but the and matlab, long or high doses of the same gene multiple copies of the same gene that is being injected and out of these few of them may integrate with the host genome and express that is the transcription of these genes would take place leading to the ultimate production of the protein. Several vaccine trials are going on based on DNA vaccines. At present, even during the ongoing epidemic of Corona, one of the pharmaceutical companies has developed a DNA vaccine. And for example, I would say uh, Zycovid, developed by Zydus Pharmaceuticals, is a kind of a DNA vaccine. Then among the newer approaches, that is the recent approaches, one is the development of edible vaccines. This concept has 
coming to the scientific forum over a period of last 10 years. Therefore, it is a very new concept which has been re recently introduced. Here, the gene encoding the orally active antigenic protein. I am using the word gene encoding the orally active antigenic protein is isolated from the pathogen and it is transferred to a suitable plant bacteria. Suitable plant bacteria. These bacteria are then used to infect the plants. As a result, that plant will be known as transgenic plant because that plant has now received the genome from other organisms, from foreign genome has integrated into it. For example, banana and potato. These plants infected by those bacteria will start producing the antigen of the interest in large scale. And then when we eat such fruits or when we eat the component of a plant, these antigens would be transferred in our body. So appropriate plant parts, either it can be fruit or it can be twig or the any component of the plant. It can be flower, it can be leaves, whatever it is. So appropriate plant parts having the antigens, it may be fed either in a raw form or in some cases cooked form to animals or human beings and this would bring about the immunization. The advantages of such oral vaccines will be, it will be low cost, it will be able to produce a large scale uh, of injections in a human population. It can be administered orally, it means no um, trained staff will be necessary. Like everybody can eat a banana but that banana is a special banana in the sense that it has got the or it would it has got a gene and that gene would when we eat will be transferred into the body and will produce a product which can induce an immunity against the infections. So the cost is low it has got the ability to produce in a large scale it means large population can be given such immunity doses. It induces the local immunity of that particular area as well as it is heat stable. The edible vaccines are still under the experimental stage. However, some formulations are available. Example, transgenic potatoes and tomatoes against diagenic organisms. So these potatoes and tomatoes, they contain proteins which would prevent the diarrheal disease in human beings. Then use of edible banana against Norwalk virus. So this was about different types of vaccines in all. Now a little bit about cold chain. What is cold chain? Cold chain as the name itself indicates a chain which is maintained at a constant low temperature. That is a cold temperature. So it is a system of transport storage and handling of vaccines which is beginning from the place of manufacturer that is at a manufacturer's levels 
एंड वुड फिनिश और वुड एंड विथ द साइट ऑफ एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन ऑफ द वैक्सीन टू द पेशेंट इट मीन्स फ्रॉम ऑल दो स्टेजेस राइट फ्रॉम प्रोडक्शन टू द रिसिपियंट हु हैज बीन एडमिनिस्टर्ड द वैक्सीन द एंटायर प्रोसेस दीज वैक्सीन आर हैंडल विद सच अ कैर दैट that is known as a cold chain low temperature handling the same is true for these vaccines which are at present given for corona right from production till it is being injected into the patient these vaccines have to be prepared and preserved and transported at a low temperature and therefore this has to be organized including logistics that is transportation special delivery transportations are necessary otherwise the vaccine may lose its effectiveness the vaccines are not stable at a higher temperature and therefore they have to be constantly kept at a temperature of either freezing temperature or below 10 degrees centigrade 5 degrees centigrade however before injections it has to be brought down to a room temperature and then injected the optimum temperature that is refrigerated vaccines is between 2 degrees to 8 degrees centigrade in cold chain protection from light is also one of the necessary conditions from some vaccines now what would happen if improper cold chain is there if proper cold chain is not available or not mm, seen then improper cold chain maintenance is one of the most common causes of vaccine failure because that vaccine has not been stored or transported at a lower temperature example is oral polio vaccine which is one of the most sensitive vaccines to high temperature to heat and therefore it must always be stored at minus 20 degree centigrade vaccines which must be stored in a freezer compartment are examples are polio and measles these vaccines must be stored in cold part that is at a low temperature but but they should never be allowed to freeze examples are tpt tt td and vcg bacillus calmeticulorum then apart from this you have hepatitis b hemophilus influenzae type b and the diluents which are necessary before that concentrate is being administered to the patient dilutions means certain fluids like saline or certain fluids containing adjuvants they are mixed to the concentrates of vaccines properly mixed by shaking and then administering it to the person concerned now coming to another thing that is how do we ensure that cold chain is properly maintained that is how to monitor how to check how to ensure that these viral vaccines are properly maintained at 0 degree centigrade because if they are not maintained at 0 degree centigrade they will not be effective that will be worst part that such vaccines are administered to the patient thinking that they are now immune so it would ultimately give a wrong conclusions and those injected would believe that we have taken a vaccine and therefore we are immune but actually in a real sense they are not 
because they were given the injections of vaccines which has expired. Now how it is monitored? In this kinds of vaccines, a heat sensitive label is fixed or it is sticked on the vaccine wire. It contains an outer blue circle and an inner white square as it is shown in this diagram. The circle is blue and inside this is a white square. So this would, this would, that white square would on improper storage or at a higher temperature would start changing its color from white to light blue to moderate blue and finally dark blue. So if these vaccines they have not been stored at a low temperature constantly before being administered you have to check for the presence of such signals. So with the increase in time and temperature the inner square would change its color gradually from white towards blue whereas the outer circle is not heat sensitive and therefore the color of the outer circle will not change. It should remain the blue throughout while the inner square should change its color from white to blue. And this gradual transit is divided into stage 1, stage 2, stage 3 and stage 4. In case of stage 1, inner square is white while the outer square is blue and vaccine can be administered. In case of stage 2, the inner square is light blue and the outer circle is blue. It still can be, it can still be used. Stage 3, the inner square is blue while the outer circle is also blue. And the last stage, that is when it turns to dark blue, up to light blue, one can use that vaccine. But once it turns slightly darker and the dark blue, that's where when turns from a white to a moderately dark and the dark blue, one should think that the vaccine has expired or I would say it has not been stored properly at a low temperature and therefore it is to be discarded. It should not be injected to the individuals. Last but not the least is the national immunization schedule as per 2020 because why I am giving you the day because these immunization schedules are revised from time to time depending upon the introduction of certain diseases as well as the newer ways, newer vaccines, how they were discovered and what type of vaccines they are. So national immunization schedules for infants, children and pregnant women. The difference is infants, they are newly born kids, children's in between age group of 3, 5, 2, 10, 15 and naturally pregnant group. That is the ladies who are going to be mother. So for them, these kinds of schedules have been worked out. For example, for pregnant women, TT and TD, the first dose is given early in pregnancy and this is the dose which is given. Where it is given? It is given in upper arm. Similarly, second dose is given four weeks after the first one and again the same place. Third is the booster dose which is given after three years. Then totally less than 36 weeks of pregnancy if it is missed 
can be given later. For infants, so for pregnant woman, this is necessary. Which one? Uh, this. For infants, you have vaccines like BCG. BCG is for TB, bacillus, calamity, urine. Then hepatitis B, oral polio vaccines. Then oral polio vaccine dose number 1, 2 and 3. Then pentavalent vaccines as we had discussed earlier. Dose 1, 2 and 3 at 6 weeks, 10 weeks and 14 weeks. And PCV at 3 doses at 6, 14 and 12 months. At 6 weeks. 14 weeks and the booster dose at 9 to 12 months. So these are the vaccines for infants. Similarly, vaccines for rotavirus, intravenous poliovirus or measles, they are being given. Then JE1 as well as vitamin A dose is also given. DPT booster dose, MR means measles and rubella, oral polio vaccine booster dose, all these things. This is a schedule for children. Now, whenever a child is born, the parents are given a card which would remind them to take the child to the physicians for giving a vaccine. This ultimately keeps a regular schedule of vaccination. If some doses are missed due to certain reasons, the physician can decide the next dose. So, after introduction of such scheduled, it has been almost made compulsory in the countries like India, the rate, mortality rate of infants have come down. So this is about the schedule of immunization in infants, in children and in pregnant women. So far, whatever we have discussed was an active immunization. Active immunization mean, remember the early part of the lecture, where the host's own cells are involved in imparting the immunity. Host's own cells, either humoral or cell mediated immunity is conferred by the cells of the host itself. Now in case of passive immunity, as our definition, if you recollect, is the transfer of immunity from one individual to the another. It means the immunity is made somewhere else and that is being given, that is being transferred to another person. This kind of passive immunity is essential when the patient does not have a time to prepare its own vaccines or to prepare its own immunity. Because in many cases, you require an immediate neutralization of venom. If toxoids are injected, it would take certain time, maybe a week or so to build up the immunity. By that time, the toxins will do its work and may kill the patient. So in such cases, an immediate transfer is necessary. 
This can also be needed in immunodeficient individuals where the individuals have lost the ability, either genetic ability mainly, to prepare the vaccines or to prepare the immunity. Under such cases, these kinds of passive immunity is being given. So what is passive immunity? It is given in form of a ready-made immunoglobulins prepared against the pathogenic microorganisms. How does it differ from normal active vaccines? Unlike vaccines, these immunoglobulins, that is the immunity which is being given to the recipient, acts faster without the involvement of the host immune mechanisms, without the involvement of the host immune apparatus. And it is useful under which circumstances? First, for immunocompromised individuals. That is the individuals who cannot synthesize antibodies. Then, it is also useful for post-exposure prophylaxis to achieve an immediate effect. And third, for treatment of toxic mediated disease to ameliorate the effect of toxins. Means to immediately neutralize the effect of toxins. Antibodies cannot neutralize toxins. Hence, they cannot be used for the treatment of toxin-mediated diseases. Some of the passive immunizations are diphtheria antitoxins, tetanus immunoglobulins, botulinum antitoxins, varicella zesters immunoglobulins, cytomegalovirus immunoglobulin, and rabies immunoglobulin. In few of them, there is also an active vaccination for the same. For example, in case of botulinum antitoxins or in case of tetanus toxins. In case of TD, tetanus toxoids are injected so the person develops an immunity on its own. But in some immediate requirements, tetanus immunoglobulin prepared in some other individuals is being directly given. Similarly, rabies vaccines also exist. When injected with rabies vaccines, the patient would develop uh, antibodies. Rabies is a disease caused by the bite of rabid animals. Now, nobody or I would say in general populations would not take these kinds of vaccines unless and until he is bitten by the organisms. However, the high risk individuals that is animal catchers or the persons who go for hunting in forest, they are knowing that we may get or the animal may attack and we may get the infections. So under these conditions, they would require an immediate transfer of rabies immunoglobulins. Similarly, hepatitis B immunoglobulins, hepatitis A immunoglobulins, rubella, measles and RH isoimmunization. This is given for uh, the disease, or I would not call it disease, but uh, erythroblastosis fetalis, where it is given to a Rh negative mother whose father is Rh positive. The first child was born Rh positive, and when the blood was being, uh, when the placenta was caught, certain blood drops, few ml of blood is being passed into the mother, mother would develop antibodies against RH and that can be transferred in the second pregnancy to the fetus.
and the fetus would be anemic. So these are the various kinds of passive immunization. So here with we finish the passive and active immunization, prophylactic immunizations or what we call it in general as a process of vaccination. Thank you very much.